All right, guys. This is our fifth read aloud for the book Tangerine by Edward Bloor. If you are reading this copy of the book, we're starting on page 50 today. This is Tuesday, September 5th. As you know, this book doesn't have chapters. It has dates. So this is Tuesday, September 5th. It's page 50 in this book, and it's page 33 if you are using the electronic PDF that we gave you. And today's going to be a little different because if you want, you can follow along with me on the screen while I read. If you want your own copy of this document I'm looking at, which is the book Tangerine, you can go to uh, the ELA course and you can download it as a PDF. It's the same thing. If you want to use the book copy, though, that's fine, too. So this is page 33 in the PDF, and it's page 50 in the book. And we're going to start reading now, Tuesday, September 5th. Mom and I had just returned from the supermarket. We were unloading her station wagon, carrying bags of groceries from the garage to the kitchen, when Eric and Arthur pulled up in the Land Cruiser. There was mud splattered all over the sides, all over the tinted windows, and even up on that center spotlight. Eric got out of the passenger side and walked up to Mom slowly and solemnly. Arthur got out and followed him. Eric stopped just inside the garage and said, Mike Costello is dead, Mom. He got killed at practice today. Mom and I stopped still. The supermarket bags weighing down our arms. Neither of us moved or knew what to do next. We stared at him speechless until he continued in the same voice. He was just standing there in the end zone. He had one hand on the goalpost, leaning on it, and kaboom! There was a crack and a flash, and he went flying through the air. He landed right on his back, right there on the goal line. By now, by now, Mom was staring hard at him, trying to understand the point of this speech. Eric, the boy, the boy who was here, like, is dead? Dead before he hit the ground. Arthur and I went over and looked at him, right? Arthur spoke up, right? The whole left side of his hair was burned off, singed right off, you know. Mom still did not seem to comprehend. She struggled for words. What? What? Eric, tell me exactly what you did. Me? Nothing. There was nothing I could do. Coach Warner, all the other coaches, they surrounded him. They started banging on his chest. Arthur added, banging on him. Doing CPR. Everybody was going nuts. Dad started running up to his car phone, dialing 911. Mom said, your, your father? Your father called 911? Yeah, ambulances came, cop cars came. They had this power pack thing, you know. Arthur said, jump starting him. They were trying to jump start his heart. They were sticking needles in him, everything, but nothing worked because he was already dead. He was dead before he hit the ground. What about Jack, Jack Costello? Was he there watching all of this? No, I didn't see him. I think his brother was there. Eric looked over to Ed Arthur. Was that his brother? Arthur said, yeah and seemed to fight back a smile. Eric continued. His little brother freaked out. He went crazy. He kept trying to take off Mike's shoes. I thought the coach was going to have to smack him. He wouldn't get out of the way. He just kept trying to get his shoes off. Did you see that? Eric looked at Arthur again, who covered up his face with his hand. Mom picked up the phone. She tried to reach Dad at his mobile number, then through his office, beeper, but she couldn't. I asked her, should I call Joey? No, no, we can't call the Costellos now. We can't intrude on them now. Mom banged out another number on the phone. I'm going to try the school. There was no answer at the school either. Mom stood there staring at the bags of groceries. She looked like she was going to pass out. The ring of the telephone made her jump. It was dad calling from the hospital. He told her basically the same story that Eric had, right down to Joey Costello and the problem with Mike's shoes. Joey and his parents were at the hospital and Mike had been officially pronounced dead. Dad said that everyone there was in a state of shock. I know I was. 
I carried my bags of groceries on into the kitchen and set them down. Then I heard a strange sound. It was the sound of voices in the backyard. Happy voices. I looked through the patio doors and saw Eric and Arthur. They were laughing. I stepped closer to the doors and I can hear Eric saying, Did you see his hair? Did you see the side of his head? He got mohawked, man. Arthur said, mohawked. I watched them in disbelief. How could they be happy? Who were these two people? Then I realized it. They were the two people who will benefit from Mike Costello's death. And they were celebrating it. Eric grabbed at Arthur's shoes and screamed in a high-pitched voice, The shoes! Give me the shoes! I turned to look for Mom. She was still in the garage, on the phone with Dad. She saw none of this. She heard none of this. I turned back to watch the cruel comedy routine on the other side of the glass. There they were, Eric and a nasty friend. Just like I remembered them in Houston. Nothing had changed except the name of the friend. I felt sick and confused. I asked myself, how could this happen? How could this happen to Mike Costello? He was a nice guy. He was number two on the depth chart. He was already accepted into the School of Engineering at FSU. And I answered myself, here's how. Because Mike Costello didn't fit into the Eric Fisher football dream. Mike would never, could never, have been sitting out there with Eric and laughing at such a thing. Now Mike is dead, but the dream lives on. Wednesday, September 6th. Mom seemed to think they would be canceling classes at the high school today and sending everyone home early because of the tragedy with Mike Costello. Mom was way off on that one. They didn't cancel classes. They didn't even cancel football practice. I watched the football practice from a distance. I stood in a goal on the soccer field, looking through the backside of the football stadium bleachers. Different pockets of players were doing different drills. It all looked very violent today. Over here, they were shouting and hitting a tackling dummy. Over there, they were hurling their bodies at a blocking sled, trying to drive it backward. In the middle of all this knocking down and getting knocked down and getting back up again, I could see Eric standing at the 50-yard line, untouched by it all. Calmly, deliberately, he drilled his field goals between the upright post and the end zone. But Mike Costello was not there to spin the laces away from the kicker and set the ball down. Mike Costello was on a slab at the undertakers. No, there was another backside in the distance today, Arthur Bowers. Naturally, Joey Costello was not at soccer practice or at school. I expected to hear something about Mike over the loudspeaker, but the only announcement they read was about reduced tickets to a carnival that's coming to Tangerine. No pray for Mike Costello or pray for Joey Costello. Miss Alvarez, though, wrote his address on the chalkboard and urged everybody who knows Joey to send a card to the family. A couple of guys at soccer practice were talking about the accident. They said that the principal of the high school, Mr. Bridges, husband of my language arts teacher, read an announcement. Mr. Bridges said the student council planned to do something special to honor Mike's memory. He didn't say what that something was. It obviously wasn't canceling football practice. Mom and dad are at each other's throats arguing about all of this, the football practice, the lightning, the kind of place we live in. Mom is determined to call the parents of each and every football player, get them together, and have them refuse to send their sons to any more t afternoon practices. Dad apparently is arguing the other side. Coach Warner now refers to dad as one of his football fathers. Dad likes that. And I think he is afraid of doing anything that might mess up his status. Mom's reply was something like, dead boys don't kick footballs. Soccer practice was a colossal drag. We spent most of the time playing a pointless and goalless scrimmage game. Sixth and seventh graders versus the eighth graders. I hate games like that. The ball never gets near the goal. Two teams full of clueless toe stubbers keep kicking it back and forth at each other, never going 20 yards past either side of midfield. The kid in the gray sweatshirt played goal for the eighth graders. He had a shutout going too.
It's obvious to me that there are only a handful of real players on the team. Our side had Tommy and me. Their side had Gino and a couple of big guys playing fullback. Everybody else who got the ball just kicked it away in a panic. We have absolutely nobody at midfield. That's why the po pointless toe-stubbing battle continued to rage. There is no in-between on this team. We have two great strikers in Tommy and Gino, and one great goaltender in me, and a freezer full of dog meat. Maybe when Tommy and Gino get together on the front line, they can feed off each other. I sure hope so. While I was standing there in the goal, waiting for something to happen, my mind started to wander. I started thinking about Joey and what he must be going through. I wondered what I would be like in Joey's place. What if my brother had landed on the goal line with the left side of his hair singed off? What if Eric was the body at the Undertaker's now? How would I feel about that? I would feel relieved. I would feel safer, but I would feel sorry too. Eric is a part of that eclipse story. I know he is. Eric is a part of whatever it is that I need to remember. I don't want Eric to die and take his part of the story with him. Thursday, September 7th. Mom began her telephone campaign at 9 a.m. She had a list of all the numbers in Lake Windsor Downs. She called everyone she knew of who had a son on the football team. After a few hours of this, she was interrupted by a call from Dad. The principal of Lake Windsor High School, Mr. Bridges, had called him. Mr. Bridges told Dad that he was getting complaints from parents about the afternoon football practices. Dad and Mr. Bridges arranged to have a meeting at our house tonight with Co Coach Warner and anyone else who wanted to come. Mom acted surprised, hung up, then returned to her list and called back everyone who had expressed interest. She asked them all to meet at our house at 7.45. After dinner, I helped mom arrange couches and extra chairs in the great room. Eric went out with Arthur. For a while, I could hear them racing up and down the perimeter road in the mud, then they were gone. By 7.55, 12 parents had arrived. They sat in the great room with dad and made small talk about the Japanese fish in our lake. Stuff like, are the koi disappearing from the lake? Are they dying? Is someone fishing in the lake at night? Could there be an alligator eating the koi? Mom answered the door at 8.05 to Mr. Bridges, a short, round man in a blue suit, and Coach Warner, who was wearing a Lake Windsor High pullover. Mom showed them to a pair of chairs next to the fireplace facing the crowd. She thanked them for coming, then took a seat next to Dad on the couch. Coach Warner sat down, but Mr. Bridges remained standing to speak. You probably know me. I'm Bud Bridges. I've been principal of Lake Windsor High since the doors opened here 10 years ago. And I have to share with you that this tragic accident is the worst thing that's happened to me as a principal. Mike Costello was a fine young man, a young man I'm proud to say I knew. His loss is a personal loss for me. Let's make sure he's the last one we lose. Everyone in the room looked at mom, who had startled them with this interruption. Mr. Bridges recovered quickly. Amen to that. I met with the student council officers today. They have decided to dedicate this year's senior awards night to Mike Costello and to plant a tree in his memory in our entranceway. Mom leaned forward. Mr. Bridges, can we count on you to stop these afternoon practices during the thunderstorm? Mr. Bridges looked over at Coach Warner. I've discussed this with the coach and I'll let him address that. Mr. Bridges sat down, but Coach Warner did not get up. He spoke quietly from his chair directly to mom. Ma'am, I also took Mike Costello's death personally. I knew Mike well. I knew him as a football player and as a leader. I know that Mike was dedicated to this team and would not want to see it destroyed because of this tragic accident. The coach cleared his throat. And that's really what you're talking about, ma'am, the destruction of this team. There really is no other time to practice, so we would be a team that did not practice. There are some boys who play for me, boys like Antoine Thomas, who are counting on football, and on this football season in particular, to get them into college. College is not going to happen for them without football. That's just a hard fact. I know some of you have the means to send your kids to college anyway. 
I'm just saying that not everybody is in that situation. Mom remained hunched forward. We're not saying don't practice. We're saying don't practice when lightning might strike and kill a player. Ma'am, there has never been another boy injured by lightning in our program. And we've been practicing in the same place at the same time for 10 years now. It was an accident, a tragic accident. Somebody gets killed in their car out on the highway. It's tragic. And we mourn the loss of that person. But we don't stop all traffic from ever using that highway again. We don't close it down. We recognize it as an accident. Mom sat upright. She pulled a small black notebook out of her pocket. Coach Warner, you may be interested in this information. This is from the Tangerine Times. August 1st, Tangerine County is the lightning strike capital of the United States. More people are killed by lightning in Tangerine County per year than any other county in America. That's not any other county in Florida, Coach. That's any other county in America. And there have indeed been other football players killed one at Tangerine High and one at St. Anthony's High. A cross-country runner was killed here two years ago by lightning. A sophomore from Lake Windsor High was killed stepping off of her school bus last year. Being struck by lightning is one of the top causes of accidental death in this area. Coach Warner looked down like he was thinking. When he looked back up at Mom, he seemed to have made up his mind. Ma'am, if you choose to remove your son from the football program based on that information, I will understand. He can turn in his playbook and uniform to me or to one of my assistant coaches. He looked at Dad, sitting back on the couch next to Mom. His whole body was stiff, rigid, like he was dead. What would he do? Would he publicly take Coach Warner's side against Mom? Or would he defend her in anger, Eric's coaches? I would not find out the answer to these questions because it was mom who spoke up. She was not ready to give up either. Mom was not ready to pull the plug on the Eric Fisher football dream that drove our lives. Why can't you hold your practices in the morning for the safety of all? I understand that these boys and you coaches and we parents are all dedicated. We can dedicate ourselves to getting the boys to the football field at 6.30. That way they can practice for an hour take showers, and be ready for class at eight. Coach Warner replied slowly, ma'am, I can't ask these players and their parents to give up their sleep, to disrupt their lives, to come out to practice football at 6.30. He paused to collect his thoughts. We have kids who can only get to school by bus. Those kids can no longer make practice. Again, this is about doing the right thing for everybody involved. Not all of my player, players have parents at home with cars who don't need to be at work themselves by 6.30 in the morning. Mom was angry now. She pointed her black notebook at him. You seem to want to make this a rich versus poor or a have versus have not issue, right? But a bolt of lightning is not aware of a kid's parent's income when it hits him. That's what we're talking about here. If you'd care to listen, we're talking about kids placed in harm's way every day because of when you schedule your practice. Coach Warner looked down again. He wasn't going to budge. Mr. Bridges was looking more and more nervous. Arthur Bauer's father said to no one in particular, it's the same thing with soldiers. They got to train in all kinds of weather so they'll be ready for anything. A long, intense silence followed. It was broken when a large man, larger than Coach Warner, stood up. He had a reddish-gray crew cut, a big head and neck, like a football player's. When he spoke, though, it was a surprisingly high voice. I'm Bill Donnelly. My son, Terry, and I live at 6200 Kew Gardens Drive. Some of you may know my house or know about it. It's the one that's been struck by lightning three times. Each time, it was at about 4 o'clock in the afternoon. My son plays football at Lake Windsor High, and I'm very proud of that, but I have to agree with Mrs. Fisher. We live in an area where this lightning strike stuff is a reality. He stopped and addressed the coach directly. I'm willing to drive my son to practice at 4 o'clock in the morning if I have to, and I'll take part in any kind of carpool we set up to make sure that every kid can get there. He turned then and looked right at Mom. I can't sell my house because of this lightning thing. 
I can't get an insurance agent to write me a homeowner's policy. But I don't really care about any of that. I care about my son and what might happen to him. I can't even imagine what Jack Costello and his wife are going through tonight. Mr. Donnelly sat down and the rest of the room finally came to life. Other parents leaned over to mom to tell her that they'd take part in a carpool too. Mr. Bridges stood up to speak. He had to wait until the talking died down. Well, all right. I think that's a good suggestion. What we can do now is present this suggestion to all the parents. We can contact the parent or guardian of each player and ask them to respond to the question. Should we move practice to early morning? Coach, does that work for you? Coach Warner was quick to agree. Of course, we can try that. Me and my staff are certainly willing. We'll ask all the parents, and if the majority want to do that, then that's what we'll do. He paused to look at Mom. Personally, I prefer another solution. Mom replied immediately, which is? Which is that we continue to practice in the afternoon, but we call a halt to it whenever there is lightning in the area. That's every day, Coach. Every day at 4 o'clock. No, it's not every day. At this time of the season, we might have rain every day. We might have rain during some of our games too, but that does not mean that there is lightning striking in the area every day. The coach stopped and no one else spoke. Mr. Bridges took the opportunity to sum up the meeting. Then we're all agreed on this course of action. We need to present this suggestion to the parents of all the players. If the majority want to move practice to the morning, we'll work together to solve the transportation problems that some boys might have. People around the room started mumbling and the meeting broke up. Mom thanked Mr. Bridges and the coach Warner for coming. They exited quickly. Other parents lingered for a short time at the door thanking mom. Mom made a point of thanking Mr. Donnelly right in front of dad for speaking up in support of our children. Dad pretended to be saying goodnight to someone else, but I'm sure he heard. By 8.30, the house was empty of guests. Mom, Dad and I worked silently to restore the furniture and straighten up the great room. Mom headed upstairs first. She said goodnight to me, but she pointedly ignored Dad. When I went upstairs, he was standing alone by the fireplace, staring at the spot where Coach Warner had been sitting. Friday, September 8th. I'm not going to dwell on this. I'm just going to say it and get on with my life. I was standing in the goal at soccer practice, taking shots from some of the starting players, mostly eighth graders. They've all picked up on what the kid in the gray sweatshirt said about my goggles. They all call me Mars. That's okay with me. I've been called worse. What's important is that I'm a player. They all recognize that. I'm their starting goalie, right? So I was standing in the goal wearing the red pullover goalie shirt handling some pretty easy shots. Gino was over on the sideline talking to Coach Welski. I saw them kind of looking at me, and then Gino came running over and yelled, Hey, Mars, is your name Paul Fisher? Yeah. Coach wants to see you. All right. I figured this was it. This was going to make it official. Coach was going to tell me how impressed he has been with my play and goal, and so on. I hustled over to the sideline. Coach Welski, you wanted to see me? Are you Paul Fisher? Yes, sir. He looked at the clipboard and flipped through some pages until he found a memo. Uh, Paul, you have an IP. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Coach Walski looked pain. I'm sorry to tell you this, Paul, but you're not eligible for this program. Sir, you can't play. You can't play soccer for Lake Min Windsor Middle School. What are you talking about I can't play? I can play. I'm one of the best players here. No. No, I mean you're not eligible to play. I am a memo from Mr. Murrow saying that you're in a special program for the visually handicapped. Is that right? So what? I could see fine. That's not the point. I don't understand what you're talking about. We have to care insurance on every boy and girl in the program where we can't play. Period. If we lose our insurance, we lose our program. I'm sorry, but there's no way we can justify putting a visually handicapped student in the goal of all places where he could get his head kicked in. He looked at me like I was crazy to think otherwise. Then he added, come on now. I screamed, no, you come on now. You see if you can kick my head in. You see if you or anybody else here can get one ball past me. One ball. Coach Walski pulled back. He 
changed his tone. Paul, I'm sorry. I know you're upset. I know you're disappointed. But try to understand this. It'd be the same situation if you had a heart murmur or a hernia or whatever. I have to play it straight with the insurance company. If any kid has any physical problem, I have to report it. And I know that this condition of yours will not be acceptable to the insurance company. Again, I'm sorry. He got even sorrier a few seconds later. I still can't believe what I did. I knelt down on that sideline, took off my sports goggles, and I started to cry. I didn't say another word. I just put my head down and cried and sobbed. Coach Walski was as much at a loss as I was. Neither of us knew what to do next. He just stood there and watched me. I heard him call an assistant over and tell him to organize a scrimmage. Coach Walski stood a little off to the side and waited. I finally stopped. I wiped my face with my goalie shirt, put my goggles back on, and walked from the field to the parking lot. I stood in the bus shelter until 5 when Mom pulled up in the station wagon. Dad was right behind her in the Range Rover. Mom rolled down the passenger side window. What are you doing here? Are you all right? I got kicked off the team. What? What happened? Coach Walski said, I'm in a program for the handicapped, so I'm off the team. That, that's outrageous. He can't do that. Well, he just did it. He said they got, can't get insurance for me because I'm in a handicap program. You know all about that, right, Mom? Me? What do you mean? You told them I'm handicapped. You told them I'm visually impaired. Darling, you are. I just told them the truth. That's not the truth. I can see. Don't you know that? Why did you fill out that stupid form when you know I can see? You saw me play in Houston. You saw me make 30 saves in one game. Do I look visually impaired then? Paul, darling, I did not know that the IEP form had anything to do with playing on the soccer team. I would never have filled it out if it did. I know how important this is to you. Listen now, your father will straighten this out with Coach Walski. She turned off her engine, got out, and went back to speak to Dad. I didn't listen, but I guess she explained the situation because Dad got out and walked to the soccer field. I remained standing in the bus shelter, watching the black outline of an osprey slowly crossing the sky to its nest. It was clutching something that flashed brightly, reflecting the sun. I said to myself, there goes another one of your coy, Mr. Costello. Mom was watching me, but she didn't say anything. Did she really believe that Dad was going to straighten this out? We both watched Dad talk to Coach Walski, and we both watched him walk back to the station wagon. He stood at the passenger window between Mom and me and said, All right, here's the deal. They have a problem with the insurance. They can't put Paul on the goal because of his vision. However, Coach Walski does want you to manage the team. He hasn't appointed a manager yet for the season, and he wants you to take the job. He said to tell you that you'd be on the bus. You'd be in charge of the team and the equipment for every game, home and away looked at mom's face. At least she understood. At least she had a clue. I didn't argue. There's nothing left to say. I looked back at dad and told him calmly, I'm not a water boy, dad. I'm not a team manager. I'm a player. And I climbed into the back of the station wagon and we all started for home. After a few miles, mom whispered, darling, do you want me to go speak to Mr. Murrow? I said, what for? To tell him that your vision has improved? Why? Do you believe that? We drove in silence for a while. Then she answered, Yes, I do. I do believe it. And I do remember those games in Houston. You were the best goaltender in that league. I was terrified to let you play, but you turned out to be the best goaltender in that league. I looked up at the rear view mirror and saw tears in her eyes. Paul, all I can do is apologize. And I promise that I'll never mention your eyesight to anyone ever again. I was too hurt and angry to tell her that I appreciated those words. That those words helped. But they did. All right, guys. That's our read aloud for this week. Please keep an eye out for the discussion threads. And after listening to all this, respond in the discussion threads. See you later.